right, well, hello and welcome back to another lecture for pre-calculus. Today we are looking at section 5.4 and section 5.5. Uh, these are going to be on trigonometric graphs again and then inverse trigonometric functions. Uh, remember that a, a trig function as an argument takes, or as an input, takes an angle or an arc length around the unit circle and then returns to you some ratio and that's or rather it returns to you an x or y coordinate or a ratio in the terms of tangent. Um, we looked at graphs last time for sine and cosine. Uh, we looked at what happens if you uh, shift them left or right or if you shift them vertically up and down. Um, and we looked at what happened when you multiplied them by a constant, so you adjust the amplitude of these graphs. Um, or if you multiply the input by some constant and then adjust the frequency or adjust the period of the graph. Uh, we're going to be looking here first at 5.4, uh, which is functions of tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to talk to you about the upcoming schedule. Uh, on April 12th, so that's in three days from now, I'm recording this Friday the 9th, on April 12th, uh, homework for sections 5, 1, 2, and 3 are due at midnight. We have office hours that Tuesday the 13th. We've got class Wednesday the 14th at 8 a.m. And office hours again on the 15th. Uh, next week, Friday, we've got quiz. Uh, a quiz on 5, 1, 2, and 3. So that's on the unit circle, sine and cosine values, and tangent values, and the other three reciprocal uh, function values as well. Um, and then graphs of these trigonometric functions or circular functions. I'm going to go a little bit further with the forecasting though. On Monday the 19th, homework for these sections is due, 5.4 and 5.5. Uh, we've got office hours that Tuesday again. And then class Wednesday and the chapters 3 through 5 test on uh, that Thursday and Friday. Okay, so put that in your calendars if you haven't yet. April 22nd and April 23rd on Blackboard. The next test will be available. Just like last time, you'll go into Blackboard, you'll click the link for the test, you'll download the file, you'll take it on some paper, you'll scan your, your solutions, or take pictures of your solutions, and then either upload them back to Blackboard um, as a PDF or as images. Okay, in the worst case scenario, you can email it to me. Um, there were a couple students that had to do that last time, but please, please put it on Blackboard. That, that just puts it all in one place for me. Um, it makes it uh, it makes my virtual desktop a lot less cluttered, and I appreciate that. Um, beyond that, chapters three to five test we're not we're not quite done yet, right? We're going to start getting into chapter six after next after next next week, I guess, and um, after the test. Uh, sorry, the week of the test we'll start getting into that, and we'll have homework due the week following the test. We had a nice break after the last one. We don't have time for a nice break here towards the end. Um, so we're going to have um, that homework due the Monday after the test, quiz that Friday, another week of stuff, and then what do we have? Finals coming up. Okay, so uh, the finals, just to announce this, it's going to be just like the test where you'll have two full days to take it. There will be a set time period. There will be a final on Blackboard. You download, you take it on scrap paper, you scan your solutions, you upload them. Okay. So I just want, but I just want to forecast that. And the last homework is actually due the week of finals on the Monday of finals on May 10th. Okay. So I wanted to schedule, or I wanted to forecast rather, the rest of the semester. This is this is also in the course calendar on Blackboard, um, so you can find all those details there as well. But I just want to get that in your brains for those of you that watch these movies. Um, forecasting for you is an important thing. So, okay, so like I said, today we're going to be looking at section 5.4. 5.4 is on more trig functions, specifically their graphs. Okay, more trig graphs. We looked last time at sine and cosine, and uh, this time we're looking at all the others. <laughs> I don't know why they do this, but all the others. Some important things to remember from last time are that uh, sine and cosine are periodic, so they repeat themselves every so often. 
And so I'll just really quickly plot those guys here. Um, okay, in red here will be sine. And then on another color I'll do cosine. I'm trying my best, but it's not going to be perfect, just like yours don't need to be. This one doesn't need to be perfect, okay? Um, we're not we're not calculators, it's okay if we don't get them perfectly. So sine of an input t. So here I'll call this the t-axis. Um, sine of t looks like this nice little wave and it repeats itself. So notice if we pick this point here, there's another corresponding point right here. And if we look at this part here, we could essentially copy and paste this part of the graph over and over and over again and get the get a complete graph of sine across the whole t-axis. Um, that's because on the unit circle, sine is just the y-coordinate, and sine, the y-coordinate, just goes up and down between 1 and negative 1 over and over and over again. So this goes up to 1, down to negative 1. Okay. Um, so we call that the amplitude. And that amplitude is this distance here, from the highest point up to the central axis, or what I call the imaginary central axis. Um, if this thing is shifted up, well then it's to that central uh, uh, the center of oscillation is sometimes what it's called, um, but that imaginary central axis. It's exactly, if you measure from here all the way up, the amplitude is exactly half that distance. Okay, But this is sine of t, just to quickly review what those uh, things about it are. There you go. This is sine of t. The next one is cosine. Cosine is a little different. It, remember is the x-coordinate of a point on the unit circle and on the unit circle no matter how many times I get it wrong we always start our angles here which is at the coordinate 1 0 no matter how many times I get it wrong we always start at 1 0 so the x-coordinate starts at 1 which means cosines graph starts up here at 1 and then it comes down to 0 because here we're at the point zero, 0,1. So at an angle of pi over 2, we're right there. And then we just keep doing this business where we oscillate back and forth. I'm going to try and match this as best I can to what's above. There's a nice pattern. The relationship between sine and cosine. Specifically, whenever sine is up at 1, we're down at negative 1 cosine is zero. So I'm trying to line these up really nicely. I don't know if it's working, but whenever sine is one, cosine is zero. Similarly, whenever sine is zero, cosine is either negative one or one. So I keep I'm trying to my best to see if these are lined up, and I, I didn't do a terrible job there. Although this <laughs> the cosine graph, it's a, it's a piece of work. Anyway, um, sorry, I was I was dragging this around just to show you, but you notice wherever wherever sine is zero, I, I didn't I didn't realize you couldn't couldn't see it there. Um, wherever sine is at zero, cosine is at either one or negative one, right? And wherever sine is at one or negative one, cosine is at zero, more or less, uh, according to my graphs. Okay, um, so what else we got? Uh, one thing that I, I didn't mention here as well. This is cosine of t. Um, cosine also has the amplitude here of 1. Uh, and cosine also has the period of 2 pi. So notice both of these have a total period of 2 pi. Okay, so if I asked you for, say, the period of cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine, or the period of secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine, I think you could put a, put a pretty good guess out there as to what those periods are. Well, they're just 2 pi, right? 
if sine repeats itself at angles according to uh, a 2 pi time interval or 2 pi angle interval, well then cosecant is going to repeat itself as well. It's just the reciprocal. So you get some value for a reciprocal. Well, exactly 2 pi radians later in the angle, you're going to get the exact same value for the reciprocal. Um, the only question is, what happens in between? Well, it looks like we've got positive values in the first half of the sines period, in the first fourth of cosines period. So the reciprocals are going to be positive. And in the second half of sine, in the middle half of cosine, we've got negative values. So the reciprocal is going to be negative. So, so those two halves aren't going to have, for sine, those two halves, the reciprocals for cosecant, aren't going to have equal values because some of them are going to be positive and the other ones are going to be negative, okay? All right. So these ones aren't too terribly difficult to, to uh, grasp in terms of periods. Let's take a look real quick at a graph of cosecant. Maybe I'll put that up a little bit. So I'm going to graph cosecant right on top here. And <clears throat> it's not going to be too difficult. So we're, we're going to think about this just uh, without making a table. I hope we're at that point now. Um, we should be able to graph functions pretty quickly, I think, just based on some things that we know about this function and the, or the formulas for them. Um, so we remember that cosecant of an angle T is just equal to the reciprocal of sine. So I'm just going to plot a bunch of things here according to this formula without making a table. But as you're listening, you can go ahead and jot these values down. It should be pretty quick. So I'm going to take some easy things here real, just to start off. I notice there's a bunch of places here where sine is zero. We can't take the reciprocal of zero, can we? So whenever you've got sine equal to zero, you're going to have something called an asymptote. Okay, you've got something that's undefined. So I'm going to draw these in here in pink, but uh, it's perfectly adequate in your sketches to not draw them at all. Okay, I'm drawing them in so that I remember that this sine graph is either going to have, well I said already, I already said it's going to be an asymptote. Uh, normally when you've got division by zero, you could potentially have a hole in your graph, so you could have a continuous line uh, that sort of comes through and then at that value there's a hole and then it just keeps going. That's possible when you've got division by zero. Another thing that is possible and which is the case here is that when you get closer and closer to this thing you either go straight up or, or faster and faster up or you go faster and faster down. Okay, these are two possible behaviors at a vertical asymptote, which is what we have in the case of cosecant. Vertical asymptotes at every value where sine is zero. So what happens in between? Well, let's plot some points. And again, I'm gonna plot easy points just like what you should do. So right here at an angle of pi over two, and right here at a value of 3 pi over 2. These are easy things to input to sign because what you get are values of 1 and negative 1. So let's take 1. What's the reciprocal of 1? It's 1. How about negative 1? What's the reciprocal of that? It's negative 1. So notice that the secant, sorry, the cosecant value is exactly the same as the sign value at multiples of pi uh, plus pi over 2. So cosecant and sine 1 over, sorry, cosecant and sine agree at multiples of pi plus pi over 2. So we've got pi over 2 plus 0 times pi. We've got pi over 2 plus 1 times pi. We've got pi over 2 plus 2 times pi. I, I hope you see that here, okay? Um, what are the other easy points to, to plot? 
So when I think about sine I, and cosines, I think the easiest things are not those things with radicals in them, like root 2 over 2 or root 3 over 2. I think the easiest things to deal with are those numbers that we've been memorizing, which are 1 half. The reciprocal of 1 half is 2. So I'm going to just put a line up here for 2 and a line down here for negative 2. Okay, so what values of, of what angles give us a sine value of 1 half? Well, it's pi over 6 is 1. So if I take this first interval and I split it up into 6 pieces, this first one is pi over 6. This one's 2 pi over 6 or pi over 3. That's the one that gives us a sine value of root 3 over 2. Then we've got pi over 2, which is 3 pi over 6. And then we've got something with a reference angle of pi over 3. And then we've got something with a reference angle of pi over 6. So those are the two that I want to focus in on. Because at those two angles, the first one is pi over 6. And the next one is 5 pi over 6. we've got values of exactly one half for sine, which means cosecant takes the value of two. So cosecant is way up here, and likewise way up here. Similarly, we can, we can copy these points into all of these other positive sections of sine. We're all the way up here, and then all the way up here again, okay? And this gives us the exact flavor of what's happening with cosecant in these, sort of inside these columns. Cosecant just grows and grows and grows and kind of approaches this pink vertical line that I've drawn. Okay? And it, since it is the reciprocal of sine, it has a period just like sine which means it repeats itself in every column, in, I guess I should say, in every other column. Let's figure out what happens in this central column here, and then we'll just copy it over here. Well, if we look at this reference angle, again, we split this up into six pieces. This one here has a reference angle of pi over six, right? Because this is pi right here, pi plus pi over six further. 7 pi over 6. So the reference angle is pi over 6, which means sine has a value of negative 1 half. Right? It's in the third quadrant now, and so it has a negative y value. So whereas cosecant, well, it's down here at negative 2. Likewise, when we get almost all the way around the circle, this is, this is an angle of 2 pi here, when we get almost all the way around, but there's still just pi over 6 left. Okay, so we're at an angle of, what are we at? 11 pi over 6. Sine is at a value of negative 1 half. So, cosecant is also at negative 2. And this is exactly the flavor of what happens in these negative intervals for sine is we get these nice little sort of you know mirror images of what happens in the positive sections mirrored and shifted this is a this is a great estimated graph of cosecant um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase the pink because that's not actually part of the graph of cosecant it was there to aid me in graphing it um, when you're graphing it on your own, you can you can drop dotted lines if you want, and then just leave them. That's that's perfectly acceptable. Um, you can draw light solid lines um, and leave them, but please don't draw like really thick dark lines um, because what that makes me think is is this. Right, if I if I left this in here same colors as what I graphed. 
it's almost like these guys are going to connect up here somewhere and then it's going to drop way down and then connect down here. It's a little confusing. So these vertical asymptotes, they're just there to aid your graphing. So if you are on a computer and have the ability to just do that, then do it. That, that's really helpful. But if you're using pencil and paper or pen and paper, just draw a dotted line there. Something like this. It'll still help you. You can still use your straight edge to help you make that really straight. Um, that's the way we used to do it back when we used charcoal sticks and rocks to do our homework in math class. But um, yeah, that's that's enough of that. Um, I'm also going to erase the sine graph here. So that was there to teach you what this cosecant graph looks like. But this is actually the cosecant graph. Okay, and I've not drawn all of it. Here's another part of it down here. And it continues in the same pattern over there and in the same pattern over here. It just keeps repeating itself. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is skip the graph of secant. <laughs> because what would you do? You would shift this graph, wouldn't you? Remember that cosine is it's literally the same as sine, but just shift it a little bit. If you haven't noticed that yet, go ahead and compare two graphs of sine and cosine. They're just shifts of each other. Right? And what is that shift? Well, it's this. We just shift sine by pi over 2 and then we've got ourselves the cosine graph. So, to get a graph of secant, what do we do? Well, we would have graphed, sorry, I've got a 3 pi over 2 sticking around here. We would have graphed cosine, which looks like this. I had this graph up earlier. This is cosine. And what I would have done is exactly what I did for cosecant. I'm going to say secant is just the same as 1 over cosine of t. I've got a little dot hanging around there. And I would have picked nice easy angles to get nice easy values for cosine, like a value of 1 at an angle of 0, or a value of negative 1 at an angle of pi, and an angle of, sorry, value of 1 up at 2 pi. And here we are at 3 pi down at negative 1, right? So we would have had the same value for secant, because the, the reciprocal of 1 and negative 1 is the same. And then I would have picked nice easy angles for reference angles. So I would have picked multiples of, this time, what? Cosine of what angle is 1 half? Cosine of? Come on, you've got to memorize, right? Come on, you've got to memorize. Sine takes a half value at pi over 6. Cosine takes a half value at pi over 3. Okay. So you would have just found those angles here. You would have, I think mine's a little bit off here. Oops, there we go. Okay, you would have found those multiples of pi over three and you just would have chugged down the line, just finding those values of one half and just reciprocating them to two and then boom, you've got it, okay? process is exactly like what I did for cosecant. All right, we're done with that. Now for the hard ones, tangent. So first, I'm going to go to a unit circle. This is where it all goes back to. That's why the beginning of this chapter is about the unit circle. So, 
sine and cosine have a period of 2 pi. Right? That's because sine is the y coordinate, and the y coordinate goes up to 1, down to 0, down to negative 1, up back to 1, or up to 0, and starts over. Cosine does something similar. It starts at 1, goes to 0, goes to negative 1, comes up to 0, goes back to 1, and then starts the whole process over. So cosine and sine have a period of 2 pi. What about tangent and cotangent? They're going to have the same period. Well, tangent is positive over here because both sine and cosine are positive. It's negative here because one of them is negative, the cosine in particular. It's negative in quadrant 4 because, well, the sine coordinate, the y coordinate is negative, and the cosine, the x coordinate, is positive. And over here, both are negative, which means we've got a positive value again. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, are the negative values and positive values that happen in each of these quadrants the same? Right, if these positive values taken by tangent here happen in the exact same sequence as the positive values taken down here, and if the negative values taken here happen in the exact same sequence as the negative values down here, then what do we know about the period of tangent? Well, we know that then one trip around the top of the circle is one full period of tangent because it's just going to restart here at the positive values, ending at the negative values, and restarting there. Okay? Now there's a nice easy exercise to, to think about this. Um, just pick a, any point here and you can convince yourselves uh, by selecting the values that we do know of, the ones you've memorized. Um, but take any point in this first quadrant and verify that the same point with the same reference angle over here has the exact same tangent value. I'll say it again. Pick any point here with some angle t. Show that its value is the same as the angle here, which is pi plus t. That way it has the same reference angle, t, right? Verify that those two tangent values are the same. Tangent of t equals tangent of pi plus t. And if you've done that, actually what you've done is more than just showing for points in quadrants 1 and 3, you've shown it for all values. And you've shown that tangent has a period of pi. Okay, So the tangent, because of all of this, that exercise that I just asked you to think about and possibly do, um, tangent has a period of pi. Okay, So let's look at a graph of tangent, and then we will think about a graph of cotangent. Tangent values are a little bit less, they're usually less memorized, and for me that is definitely the case. So I'm going to work through some of these um, in front of you, which is a dangerous thing. Doing math in front of people is very dangerous. So here we go. Sine and cosine. I'm going to, I'm going to lay out some multiples of pi here. And we're going to think about sine and cosine values at some angles so that we can think about tangent values. So let's think about these multiples of pi first. What happens to sine and cosine, because remember tangent of some angle is the sine of the angle over the cosine of that angle. What about the sine and cosine of an angle 0. Let's just plot those. When you plug in 0 to sine, you get a value of 0. When you plug in 0 to cosine, you get a value of 1. So it's 0 over 1. And it's the same 
at every multiple of pi. It's zero. If we think about the unit circle, which I can throw up here for you, at these angles, zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, or the negatives, the sine coordinate is always zero. So we always get a fraction of zero over one or zero over negative one. So for all of these multiples of pi, whether positive or negative, the tangent is always at zero. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna graph some of the easy points. <laughs> Okay, so easy ones are ones now where either sine and cosine are equal. Okay, so I'll give you a second to think about at what angle sine and cosine are equal. That's right, at an angle of pi over four or at any angle which has a reference angle of pi over four. <laughs> Very good. So let me, let me split our sections on the number line here into fourths. We did, we did this with thirds and with sixths in the previous section with sine and cosine, right? Sorry, with cosecant and secant just, just a second ago, we just did it. But with tangent, it's far easier to graph those fourths because that's where the sine and the cosine are equal. So we're talking about this angle here, this angle here, this angle here, and this angle here. That's pi over four. That's three pi over four. That's, what's this, six pi over four. I do that, that's definitely wrong. What do I say? Three pi over four, four pi over four, five pi over four. Like I said, doing math in front of people is dangerous. Then adding two more to that, seven pi over four. All right, there we go. We can also go in the negative direction. So we'd have negative pi over four, negative three pi over four, negative five pi over four, negative seven pi over four, okay? So at all of these angles, sine equals cosine, but the signs might be different. Uh, the, the plus or minus sign, S-I-G-N, might be different. The sine, S-I-N-E, is equal in value to the cosine value, but the sine, S-I-G-N, might be different. Okay, so at pi over four, um, what do we have? At pi over four, we've got two values that are the same and have the same sign. They're both positive. So tangent of pi over four is one. So here's pi over four. We're up here at one. What about an angle of negative pi? That's down here. They have the same values, sine and cosine of the same values, but one of them now, in particular the sine, has a negative sine S-I-G-N in front of it, right? It's below the x-axis. So here we have a ratio of negative one, and that's at the angle of negative pi over four again. Okay, let's plot these other points around our multiples of pi. Okay, at three pi over four, that's right here, three pi over four. The cosine value is negative, but the sine is positive. So we're gonna have negative one here. At five pi over four, that's this angle here, they're both negative, so their ratio is positive one. And we're gonna have a repeating pattern here with all of these, both in this direction, to the left and to the direction in the direction to the right. I'm trying my best to plot these as accurately as possible. I hope it uh, it looks like I'm sort of angling up here on the right. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that's we're gonna call that good. So at this point, with just those points plotted, it makes it seem like this is gonna look like a wave, like sine or cosine, but that's not the case. Let's look at some of these other values, uh, these other angles that are, quote, nice. 
Um, these would be the angles where cosine is zero. So when we have a division by zero, remember we can either have an asymptote like we saw in secant and cosecant, or we can have a hole. In the case of tangent, you can just believe me, we have asymptotes again. And what are those angles where cosine is zero? I'll graph these ones in pink this time. Sorry, in uh, yellow this time. Um, these are at angles of pi over two. Cosine is zero up there. And at negative pi over two, or at three pi over two, if you're if you if you're talking about the positive one. Okay. So let me plot these vertical lines to help us when graphing. That's negative pi over two. This one is pi over two. This is the next one around. So this one is three pi over two in that direction. This one is negative three pi over two. And then I, I could keep going, but I'm gonna stop there. Um, okay. So now the question is, um, what does the rest of this tangent graph look like? Does it, does it sort of do this and then keep going? Does it turn around? What does it do? And really to check this, all you need to do is just plot a few more points. And there are still some easy points to plot, but um, really stick with those angles of, for this, in this case, pi over three, which is right about there, just a little bit bigger than pi over four, and negative pi over three. Uh, you know what sine and cosine are going to be there because you've got those values memorized. So you know what you're going to get and you know that that value is going to be bigger than one. And so it keeps going there and this one's going to be just less than negative one. So it's going to keep going down here. And so that'll convince you all the more that tangent does this thing that looks kind of like an x cubed graph. So let me erase this and try and plot it as best as I can here. So it kind of looks like an x cubed. So it comes up to the x-axis and flattens out. And then it starts skyrocketing, skyrocketing off again um, with fewer wiggles than what I just graphed there. Okay. So it comes up, flattens off, keeps going. So, and then it just repeats itself over and over and over again in these different intervals. It, it should be apparent right now that I'm not the best at graphing tangent uh, with the computer mouse. I'm not gonna lie to you and say that I'm better at this with a pen and paper, because <laughs> I'm probably not. Um, but this is more than adequate. If I erase these yellow asymptotes that I drew in just to help guide my graphs, this is what tangent looks like. Okay, it's it's really just uh, a repeated. Really, it's like a repeated x cubed graph. Okay, and um, yeah, how how you find it again is just by looking at some easy angles. I would suggest multiples of pi over four. At the odd multiples, you're going to find these nice values of plus 1 or minus 1. At the even multiples of pi over 4, you're going to get nice values of either um, 0 or you're going to get nice values of asymptotes. <laughs> so um, multiples of pi over 4 for tangent are really, really handy. Similarly, for cotangent, I wish, I wish that I could just... I wish that I could just erase something and slide it, but I can't. Not for this one, I gotta do it. So it's gonna be rough, so stick with me. Not, it's really not gonna be so rough, but cotangent, what is cotangent? Remember, cotangent is just the reciprocal of tangent. So let's graph it based on what we've got here. So notice everywhere tangent is zero, what are we gonna have? Just like before, you might guess we're gonna have asymptotes, and you're right. So I'm gonna put these in. Everywhere there's a 
value of zero for tangent. Because we with cotangent we're taking one over tangent, so we're taking one over zero at these at these angles. These are the even multiples of pi over four. Uh, sorry, the even sorry, the multiples of of, uh, of pi. Okay, I'm stuck on pi over fours for some reason. Okay, and then in green I'm doing cotangent. Okay, and uh, what were some of the nice values that we had for uh, for tangent? Well, we had these multiples of pi over four. And let's look specifically at the multiples where we got a value of one because we all know the reciprocal of one. The reciprocal of one is one. <laughs> so at every point where the tangent was one, the cotangent is also one at that point. So all these green points are points where the tangent and cotangent intersect. Okay, now let's look at all the angles where the cotangent, sorry, where the tangent was negative one. And these were these multiples here like 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 and then in the negative direction negative um, negative pi over 4 and negative 3 pi over 4 all of these points are where tangent was negative 1 so cotangent is also going to be negative 1 so I can plot all these points and they're the same okay and what about everything else in between so now what we'll do is we'll think about the points where we had asymptotes before for tangent. Those red angles of say pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So these angles, which I'll mark off here on the axis. Those are the angles which gave us the division by 0 where the cosine was 0. Now the sine was either 1 or negative 1 but the cosine was 0. Well now, because we're taking the reciprocal of tangent, we have the exact opposite thing happening. We're taking 0 divided by 1 or negative 1. Which means that all these angles, which I've graphed here on the x-axis, sorry, the t-axis in green, that's where cotangent takes the value of 0. Okay, and you could, you could analyze the unit circle just a little bit to find that out. You know, just look at this definition and think about that and then think about how cotangent is defined as the reciprocal and it would be pretty obvious why those values are zero. And again those angles are going to be angles like pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2 or what's the one after uh, 5 pi over 2 that's the next one around and then we've got 7 pi over 2 or you can go in the negative direction you go negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 5 pi over 2 etc etc. Okay. What else does cos uh, cotangent do in between here? Well, it looks just like tangent, that x cubed, but it's going to be reversed. And it kind of it kind of speaks for itself now, though my graph won't. It's going to do this exact opposite thing of sort of flattening out around zero, and then rocketing off to infinity. Outside there, okay. I promise that I can talk normally while I'm graphing. I just pre I just prefer to slow down while I'm graphing. Um. <laughs> All right, this cotangent graph. Oof, it is looking good. It is everything my high school teacher would have wanted, I think. And it's all that I would want too. You don't need to have a more accurate graph than this. This green graph is cotangent. Okay, so now I'll erase the asymptotes. If yours are dotted lines, that's fine. If they're solid lines, just try and make them lighter in color than your other part of the graph. Um, and really, I've got the tangent graph on there too, but this is good to see them both. So now, because you can pause and rewind this, this video that you're watching, I'm going to erase the tangent graph to give you just the cotangent graph. Okay, so this is the graph of cotangent. Done. Okay, easy peasy. Cotangent, just like tangent, has a period of pi. Uh, we can adjust these periods just like we did with um, 
just like we did with sine and cosine. We multiply the input by some constant. So what we're going to say here is y equals tangent y equals tangent sorry a times tangent of what does your book use x it's it has x here so k times x and it also says y equals a times cotangent of k times x. Your book does not have these parentheses here. I prefer to have the parentheses there. Um, yeah. Okay, so if k is 1, what do we know about the period of these guys? Well, the period is just 1 pi, right? Just 1 pi. Not 2 pi, it's just 1 pi. But what if k is some number that's positive? So if k is 0, we don't know the thing, but if k is positive, something similar happens uh, with tangent where when k is less than 1 or when k is bigger than 1, we get either we get either uh, stretching or compressing in the horizontal direction. So one easy way to compute the period for these guys, just like the easy way we had for cosine and, and sine, 2 pi over k, we have the exact same thing here but it's pi, not 2 pi, it's just pi. You take the normal frequency, the, norm, the normal period rather, and you scale it by whatever k is. Okay, The normal period for sine and cosine is 2 pi, the normal period for tangent and cotangent is pi. So we're just scaling it with that k. What happens if k is negative? Maybe think about that. Remember what that does with your graph. If you plug in the negative of your previous inputs every time, all that does is it takes the things that are graphed on the negative x-axis and puts them on the positive x-axis. It takes things that were previously put up on the positive axis side, moves them to the negative side. So it's just a horizontal flip. We flip across the y-axis is what I mean to say. So if you plug in a negative k, the period is going to be the same if you take the absolute value of this. okay, But the graph will be reversed. It'll be in the opposite orientation. What does A do? <laughs> so remember with sine and cosine, we had our little graph. And if we had a, a big number multiplied by that, it affected the amplitude. Right, so we, we, we stretch this thing vertically. If we had a little a multiplied by it, something between zero and one, well, we shrunk the graph vertically. This same stretching vertically and, and compressing vertically happens with tangent and cotangent. Okay, so with an a that's bigger than one, those, those kind of x cubes or the reversal of x cubed, uh, they get stretched out vertically. Okay, so they're less flat around the zeros they go up and down faster, um, the same thing happens Okay, if a is bigger than 1. If a is less than 1, bigger than 0, it gets flatter around that 0 part. So the original tangent graph will say look like this. Well, the new one will be flatter here. Okay, it will be flatter there if a is between 0 and 1. Um, I'm erasing the evidence. Uh, I'm terrible at graphing these things by hand with a computer mouse. Um, uh, we don't, remember with sine and cosine, we referred to these numbers here, the absolute value of them, as the amplitude. We don't refer to them as the amplitude in these cases. Okay, this is just, you could call it our, our vertical stretching constant. <laughs> With sine and cosine, it makes it makes sense to talk about the amplitude because these look like waves, right? This this cosine or sine graph down here looks like a wave, so we can measure the amplitude of the wave. Tangent and and cotangent don't look like waves. Cosecant and secant don't look like waves. Okay, they're reciprocals of waves, or they weren't even waves to begin with. Tangent, cotangent, so. 
we don't refer to A as the amplitude. It's fine to refer to it as amplitude when you're talking about sine and cosine. That's totally fine. OK. Um, next, secant and cosecant, and then we're going to be done. So with secant and cosecant, how do multiples of A and, uh, and K affect our period and affect our vertical stretch factor? Uh, it's the exact same as what you would expect from secant or from cosine and sine and from tangent and cotangent. So we're going to take the original period, which was 2 pi, and we're going to adjust it by that multiple of k. And then a is just going to be some number that either flattens out those, those little scoops. So if this is the original, if a is less than 1, this thing is going to be flatter in here. And if it is bigger than 1, this thing is going to be stretched vertically like that. OK? So it's going to either accentuate that, uh, that asymptotic behavior of going really high up to infinity. It's going to accentuate that. It's going to accelerate the rate at which you go up. Or it's going to decelerate it. So it's going to be flatter towards that 0 point. Okay. All right. So that's it for this section. You'll be asked in the homework, I'm guessing, to to look at several cosecant graphs, tangent graphs, cotangent graphs, and um, and vertical shifts or horizontal shifts of these things, and uh, just just try to remember that um, when you're shifting something up or down or left and right, the graph is unchanged. Right? You still can think of all the same old angles that you thought of before. So pick the easy ones. Um, it's just that your graph is going to be moved left or right or up or down. So pick easy angles to use um, for, your, for your tables that you make. Try and remember these, these standard examples of just the vanilla tangent. Uh, 1 times tangent of x, 1 times secant of x. Um, Try to remember those so that you can um, more easily graph the adjusted or shifted graphs. Okay? All right, that's all I've got for you for this section. I'll be back in, in a bit for section 5.5 on inverse trig functions uh, and their graphs. So I hope, I hope that that helps. If not, shoot me an email and I'm happy to get back to you. Okay? Until next time.